There we go. Okay, now I think we are broadcasting some. This broadcast is going to be recorded. We have record, started recording now, and we will be posting this of it, um, on our website at the conclusion of the webinar. We try to get it up within a day, and I think we should be able to get it up probably sometime tomorrow. So um, everybody will be able to go back and review it, and um, you'll be able to share that. We do not send out the slides to anyone just for control purposes. Um, I'm, a, I'm a controlling freak. Is that, is that how one says it? I don't know. No, I'm not. But um, generally speaking, so you'll, you'll have the recording of the webinar available, and you can review that. Uh, if you wish, share that with anybody you want to. Um, if, you're, if your question gets answered and featured, you know, you can use that as bragging rights or something, kind of like calling into the radio. I don't know. But anyway, today I've got with me uh, Mary Sherwood from Gel Laboratories. Uh, they are a local lab uh, here in town with us, and uh, we partner with them with, on a lot of stuff, actually, that we do. Um, lots of our product development uh, will um, at least go through some uh, feedback with them just because they're so close, and they do a lot of different things, so they can help with a lot of stuff. And Mary has been with Gel for how long? 17 years. 17 years. So she's done a lot and knows what she's talking about and she's going to share some of her wisdom with us today and we will all be a lot smarter at the end of it. <laughs> Hopefully everyone, um, so just want to call out the title of the webinar. Um, it made me chuckle when I came up with this. Um, I hope everyone at least somewhat got the little pun I see. Understanding ion chromatography, I guess I have to explain it. It's not as cool as I thought it was. But anyway, there we are. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get started um, and start talking about ion chromatography. So ion chromatography, what is it? Um, what we're doing is we're using ions, charged particles, to uh, detect things. Uh, neutral atoms, uh, molecules, in and of themselves are tough to detect, um, but it was discovered that using the charge of the particle can not only help you detect it, but can also help you isolate it and separate it from other things in solution as well. So basically what we're looking at is our cations or our anions. That's what our conductivity-based ion chromatography is all about. If it is an uncharged particle like sugar, for example, uh, sugar generally doesn't carry a charge, that is not something you can do uh, electrical ion, uh, ion chromatography with. Um, you have to have some um, particle, some charge on your particle of some sort, either um, something like ammonia or potassium, calcium, those are your, your positively charged ones, or maybe some of your negatively charged ones, fluoride and chloride, uh, nitrates and nitrites, those kinds of things. So we have to have some kind of a charge on that ion or on the particle in order to be able to detect it with this particular brand of ion chromatography. The way ion chromatography works, and this is kind of a, um, so a lot of what you will see, these images uh, throughout today's slideshow are things that I did a Google image search for and pulled them offline or off of online. Um, and so I pulled, I tried to be equal opportunity with all the main um, IC providers out there, Dionix and Metrome and Shibatsu and so forth. Um, so those of you who may frequent their websites may see some things that you've seen before um, and they work really well. So uh, basically what we've got here just a, a kind of a flow diagram of how ion chromatography works. We're starting with our eluent buffer, uh, the mobile phase, your eluent, how, however that's described. Um, a lot of times um, what we're working with in the environmental lab is some kind of a carbonate um, buffer, maybe sodium hydroxide, depending on how you've got it set up, what you're working with. But um, that is kind of a continuous flowing um, matrix through the entire instrument. You've always got that going as long as the instrument is running. And then, um, so that's, that's what that L1 pump is there for. And then after the pump, you have some kind of injection for your sample. Most of us are fortunate enough to be able to use auto samplers. 
so that we don't have to sit there and set a timer for 19 minutes or 25 minutes or whatever your runtime is and take your syringe and automatically inject uh, or manually inject it through the port on the front and make sure to do the exact same pressure so that you get the same loading every time and so forth. So we've got our auto samplers that's putting our samples in. And from there, um, it, it's, it's not actually shown in this diagram, but uh, usually there is some kind of a sample loop um, that moderates the amount of sample that gets injected. And it is, in my experience, it's, it's just a length-based uh, piece of peak tubing. Uh, you cut a peak tube into a certain length, a, a certain diameter, inner diameter, and you know that's going to give a certain volume of sample. And so um, your valve uh, takes the majority of your sample and flushes through to clean everything out, uh, traps a certain amount of sample in that peak or in that in that loop, switches the valve around so that it will then inject into your instrument through your column, and then flushes the rest of it out to waste. So once it hits the ion exchange column, this is where the magic happens. Uh, that column is packed with all sorts of interesting particles, uh, usually some kind of polystyrene-based uh, resin. And its purpose is to interact with and slow down your ions based on their electronegativity. Uh, typically, your more more electronegative will go through the column, at least for your for the anions. Um, I, I don't remember if the cations work that way. I've never worked personally with the cations. Um, well, well, anyway, with anions, your most electronegative ones tend to come off first. And what happens is they are carried off with the mobile phase, kind of in bands um, in that mobile phase. And from there, it passes through your detector which is nothing more than a really cool conductivity meter mounted in line in your instrument. And as the charged particles flow through the conductivity meter, you get a response, which on our graph there is measured in microsiemens. And um, so you measure the electrical response over time. And the intent is that each ion will always come off at the same time and so you know that at this time this ion comes off and this time that ion comes off and so forth you can identify them based on time and you use your peak height area however it's set up to then cal calculate the amount of that ion in solution uh, it's a really fun thing uh, this was uh, this was always my favorite instrument to run just because of a, how hands-off it is. You get to load it up and walk away. And then B, it just the kind of the mystery of the peaks and, and what each peak would look like. And are there going to be some unidentified peaks that show up that you just don't know what are? And honestly, you don't care, but they're fun to look at anyway and theorize. And so yeah, I always like working with ion chromatography uh, just because it felt, it, it, it was fun. It, it, was, it was fun to work with. So a little bit of the history of our iron chromatography. Basically, the, the concept as we know it today um, started back in the 40s. And this was work related to the Manhattan Project. And these guys were trying to separate some rare earths. And uh, they, it was our, our cations is what uh, they were looking at there. And it was truly just a separation principle at the time, they were using it to, they, they collected fractions to uh, isolate particular rare earths in solution so that they would then be able to have a relatively pure sample. Um, and then in the 1950s is when somebody came up with a brilliant idea of actually being able to track this and measure it uh, with uh, electrical, you know, electrical conductance. And that's when our anionic, um, analysis came into being. That's when uh, people actually started looking at fluoride, chloride, sulfate, nitrates, nitrites, bromide, those kinds of those those common ones that we do now in our wastewater analyses. Uh, that, that actually came out of the 50s. Uh, things kind of went along smoothly from there, you know, a little bit of advancement in, in the detectors and, and in the columns to get better separation and so forth. The 70s is when probably what we would identify now as our modern ion chromatography really came into play with the introduction of the suppressor. 
and that was used to um, minimize the uh, eluent contribution to our uh, conductivity and really clean up the baseline and it did a lot to improve the lower detection limits that we could find and help a lot in, in getting some of those um, less common ions or, or less intense ions actually I guess is a better way to put it um, and really improve our detection amount. So that's kind of the background for IC. Um, that's, that's what we work with. That's, that's the magic that happens in that uh, cool rectangular box on your uh, lab bench and how you get those results, that how those peaks are printed out for you. So now we're going to do something a little bit different than what we've done in previous webinars. And we're going to kind of have, uh, Mary and I are going to have a conversation and you guys get to listen to us. And we're going to probably make some bad jokes and we're going to talk about her experience um, in, in all these years working at gel laboratories and some things that she's seen. Um, remember, all of, all of what she's got coming now is coming from a production lab viewpoint, which a lot of you are going to be in similar situations. Some of you may not be exactly the same. So remember, this is her experience from her lab. Um, your lab may be a little bit different. As always, we're going to throw out the disclaimer that none of what we say is gospel truth. Your auditor, your regulator, uh, gets to make the final call on everything that happens. So any particular questions, if what we say sounds different than what you do, that's probably because of it is different in your state or your program area or something. So we'll try to talk as generally as we can, but again, we're colored by our experiences and so forth. So. With that being said, let's jump right in and let's start with our first topic. So the first thing we're going to talk about is IC calibration. Um, we use IC because it can detect a lot of things at one time. Uh, most of you are doing fluoride, chloride, nitrite, nitrate, nitrate, nitrite bromide, bromide, orthophos, sulfate, sulfate, with occasional other things, maybe thrown in there. Occasional iodine. Nice iodine. Uh, and oxalate. We, of course, we haven't done oxalate in a while, but oxalate okay. was, that's you, we usually did that for a bit. Yeah. So with all that being said, you've got a lot of different calibration curves that you've got to maintain. So when you're calibrating your instrument, what are you, what are you looking for? What's the, what are the basis of starting well, your calibrations? Well, your calibrations, you normally start, I think, a mo a most EPA methods or something like that. Say minimum of three standards in a blank. Okay. To me, the more optimal one is anywhere from five to seven, include and and with a blank. So what is what is what do we get from adding those extra points in? It it, uh, it you can get a better detection limit. Okay. And it'll be a more accurate because you want to get like a nine. Your correlation should be a nine nine five or better. Right. Me, myself, I like my correlations to be 99.8 right. or 9. Okay. And the more points you put in there, the more accuracy you're going to get and the better baseline, it's, the linearity is going to be a lot better. Where do you usually see uh, the problems when you're calibrating? Is it top end or low end? It's Where usually the low end. Low end. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it's usually going to be your, your y-intercept. Right. To, that's usually where your problems are going to be. And the tighter you make them, the better they'll be, but in a production lab, we we basically do we try to go as wide as we can for it each one to to minimize dilution, right? Okay. Because we are a production lab, um, some areas you might have to do a little, you know, you might have to go a little smaller, so you don't you might you might have to do more dilution, right? Because you can't get the bottom in to be proper okay so it, it's uh, but usually five to seven standards okay. Good. usually work real well do you like to uh, do individual calibration standards or do you make a multi no we now we have solution? we have a multi and that's the reason why we we have so many right is I have all seven anions in mine okay and and we have different levels 
for different anions, like orthophos and bromide, we had to make smaller because we were having problems on the low end. Gotcha. So my highest point on on bromide and orthophos is three, where sulfate is 20. Okay. So that's, you have to figure out, you know, what how many points in there and, and, and you have to get, you know, you want to start at the top, one at the low end, and then you want to go in the middle and then try to... Right. Divide Break it out from there. Yep. Correct. Okay. Nice. Okay. Let's look at our next slide. Retention time. So after you've got everything calibrated, the idea is that you each peak is going to hit the same time every, every time, time you do it. Now, occasionally, those of you who have worked with IC know that you have the dreaded retention time shifts. And we've got a blow up here. Um, you can see this is a period of 0.3 minutes. So what's that? Ten? No, twenty seconds. Twenty second shift there in those in those peaks. Um, so what happens? Why do we see this retention time shift? What? There are several reasons why you see that. Okay. I mean, there's not there's more than one. So it, you're, you're the, the most common ones. If, what's your first thing that you try? Well, to see um, basically you're you're at the wear and tear on your column. Okay. So you're going to, usually your retention time is going to go down. Right. Because the more you keep using that column and the guard column, the the more it gets compacted and then it's going to not work as well. Okay. Uh, your eluent strengths, if you don't, if you're not making sure you, that your eluent strengths are identical time and time and time again, you have a little shift. Okay. Um, contamination. Uh Contamination is the biggest and problem right. in IC. The everything you do all stems on contamination. The more you put into it, the more contamination you're going to get, and the least the least likely you're going to get good results. Right. And uh, I know that um, some of the heavy metals are really bad for your for your column. Correct. Uh, silver and cadmium and lead; those things will those will poison your columns pretty quickly. Yes. So if you know, maybe if you and they'll also hurt your suppressor. Also. Oh, I was not aware of that. Okay, so they'll decrease they your suppressor life. Yes. So uh, if you've got friends in your metals lab, you might want to have them alert you if anything's in for IC. If they get big hits on some of those. It, it's nice if you can have that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So if you see a retention time shift, so we mentioned um, age of the column may be something, so you may actually have to end up just replacing the column itself. Correct. We do have quite a few, and we've had samples that have one injection has destroyed our Ooh, column. Yeah, so, you love those I mean, guys. You, you get those guys occasionally. Yeah. And uh, But yeah, as far as the shifting goes, once you clean your system up, right. then you, you can either recalibrate because as long as yeah. it's consistent, then you can just recalibrate, right. and and you can usually keep that going for a while. Okay. I mean, it's not like it's gonna die within, you know, for two or three uses. You can. Right. I mean, there's been times we've kept our column for six months. Yeah. And um, and and the cleaner you can keep your samples, the more you uh, filter your samples. Right. I use a a, a point two. Okay. I think most methods say 0.45, right? But, but being in a production if you're lab, really paranoid and, well, yeah. it just helps. Yeah. The cleaner you can keep your system, that's the biggest thing on this whole thing. Is the cleaner you can keep that system, the better off you are. Yeah, the more consistent you are. Yes. Correct. And uh, I had something I was gonna say. Oh, uh, the methods do give us that guidance. I forget the actual number, but yeah. you do have to monitor it, and if it gets outside a certain window, a certain percentage, correct. Then uh, and then you either have to change out your columns, or you have to recalibrate. recalibrate, or depending on what is causing, right? You have to find out what yes. what's causing solve it the problem, solve yes. the problem, and get back. Okay, let's go on. Ooh, our, everybody's favorite topic, MDL. So we're not going to talk a lot about this. We just had to bring it up just because it's something that everybody needs to know about. So basic MDL procedure, just real simple. Well, you have your seven reps. Okay, seven replicates. What's your, what's your target concentration to usually shoot for? Uh, 
Well, you usually run your, your uh, PQLs. So the low standard. So your lowest okay. standard possible, get seven reps. Um, the, the new, the 20,017 MUR yep. procedure is now incorporating blanks. Mm -hmm. um, the good thing is, because I am a production lab, I have a quality department. <laughs> and it is awesome because they basically, they log us, our MDLs quarterly. Okay. And then we do verifications, and it's a rotating. Then they, they use LIMS for, for the blank. Nice. So we have incorporated. You, so you've already incorporated the blank. Well, yeah, we, are, we are incorporating nice. the blank in ours. And uh, I, I think for us, you know, it's probably still we're going to still use our MDLs because in some areas they might have, because we do have fairly clean blanks. Good. Other areas probably they might have, it just depends on which one's best for them. So in y'all's case, the blank, the addition of blank calculations didn't actually change your MDL too much. Not really, no, okay. no, 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 not at all. But uh, and and it's ongoing with with them using the limps and just generating all this data. Right. As we you know we run them and then they just generate them, generate them like they're supposed to. It's an ongoing procedure nice. that it, it stays in pretty good, and we don't usually we have don't have any problems. Nice. So the solution to making MDLs work well have a good quality department that can do most of the, <laughs> well, most of the math and, and have a limb system that <laughs> can pull system. all that stuff up. That right. would be awesome. But yeah, it, it's, it's, um, and, and if you keep your system clean and stuff, you're going to have, you, you're going to have yes. good, yeah. you know, uh, and if you do have problems, the thing is find out what it is that's causing the problem and fix that and then go back and do them again. There you go. All right. Next topic. This is one of my favorites. This is always a, a real fun challenge when you start working with chromatography, any kind of chromatography in general. Um, you get co-eluding peaks. Sometimes, um, so if you're running your standard, obviously those are pretty and those separate out nicely. But standards are, what, 10% of what we inject maybe? Mm -hmm. um, and then we've got our real samples. And occasionally our real samples will have peaks that look a little bit like this. Yes, where you just have stuff smooshed together. So there's different ways to deal with co-eluting peaks. Um, let's pretend that you can't separate them. You, you don't have the time or the expertise necessary to change your program to actually make the peak separate. You're, you're stuck with your peaks smushed together like this. Correct. So yeah. what do you, what do you do? How, what are these different options that we look at here? Well, the, the first one is splitting a peak and uh, that one is probably the, most used right. is splitting your peaks. It, it's uh, and uh, as long as everything's done the same way throughout the whole thing and make be consistent about it. Right. And as long as you get good uh, post spikes and things like that, it, it's very it's a it's a good system. Right. Okay. Um, the B one that's the valley to valley where it takes some. I, I don't usually use that one very often. Because you know you always want to go to worst case scenario right. in the first place. <laughs> uh, that way it depends on. I mean that's probably blown up, so it probably doesn't comes up and not as high as it actually yeah, looks yeah, there. Yeah, that's, that's just so it, it's probably. I mean it it would be acceptable as long as you do that throughout your whole, as long as your standards and everything else do the same thing. That's 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 an important thing you mentioned there is make sure your standards are calibrated that way. Correct. Whatever whatever your you have procedure funny. is it. That's how you need to follow it. Okay. You know, um, then number C, that's a, uh, they call it sh uh, shape shouldering. Okay. And both of them. Now D, I don't, I, to me that looks like an improper shape shoulder, but. I've, I've actually never seen that technique before. Again, I pulled this one off Google Images, so that one. I, maybe, I'm not really sure about that one. <laughs> maybe in multiple choice, this is. I mean, you Pick could shape that shoulder work. like that, but that wouldn't be the way I would go. Right. <laughs> I would I would stick with C. Yeah, that, but that does like look... you said, you've got to be consistent about it. Okay. Standards, the whole thing has to be. Yeah, I think C would be a lot closer to the way your standard would have been evaluated, rather than Correct. D trying to drop that, you know, kind of interpolate that base or that. I line mean, I'm sure that. if you went by the height and the width, and if you wanted to do the old way, you, you could do that. <laughs> do it that way yes yeah all right so I think our next slide is some of the stuff oh nope not yet so here's some misshapen peaks um, the one after this is actually some stuff that you brought in um, some some 
actual chromatograms that you've evaluated yourself, and we'll look at those a little bit. Um, but that first one there, so that's just a normal peak. The broad peak in the middle there, that's... That's usually, that and, I think sometimes you get broad peaks when your system's going. Okay. I mean, sometimes you'll get the, um, I can't remember right off the top of my head, but the broad peaks, if you start getting a lot of broad peaks, then you, then you need to look into your system, either your suppressors or your, your column or something's yeah. probably wearing down. The second and the third ones are the ones I've seen most commonly, our tailing and our fronting peaks. Right. Now, now if you'll notice, fluoride a lot has tailing. Yes. That's just its normal look. Right. I mean, it can, depending on which column you use, but the one that we use, that's a normal look. The fronting is usually uh, matrix. Matrix problems? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, peak spikes and peak splitting, they're really related to one another. Um, I guess the spike is just kind of an offset, whereas the peak splitting is everything up at the top. And that's that's There's common to it in matrix issues. Matrix issues. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So let's take a look next at some of our some more misshapen peaks. So here we go. All right. This is one that you brought in. Mm -hmm. And tell me what you look at when you or what you see when you look at this. Well, depending on what you're looking for, <laughs> what <laughs> you all, need to report, all sorts of fun stuff because there's here. all seven of them are there. And like for fluoride, you, you definitely that's matrix issues. Okay. And the way that we deal with matrix issues for the most part is dilution. Okay. Okay. So at that point, I'm looking at fluoride. I would, I would want to dilute that because that's not a good peak to be trying to. Trying to integrate, right? Yeah. Now we have we've definitely blown up on this because you can see. Oh yes, I, I blew it up so you could see how yeah. how bad it is. That nitrate nitrate. That's a common area right there to where we get interference. Okay. So that's that happens a lot. And basically, again, we do a dilution. That is probably a, a 5 to 10x dilution that we'll need to do. All right. And I think, to get that nitrate out of that matrix area. Yep. And we've got a couple examples of some further dilutions as we, as we yes. click through this one. So how about that orthophosphate peak? Now that's that's a double dip too. You've got some kind of interference there, and like I said, basically I would dilute that too, depending on what the post spike says. Okay. All right. So let's click through and look at the next image. So here's a dilution that's been done on that same thing. Mm -hmm. So what is cleared up here? Is there anything? Is this a good one for any of those, or do you still uh, not like these? your bromide? Okay. So the bromide is now looking good. Yep. And uh, the nitrate, and could probably could possibly be uh, reported there. Okay. Like I said, it depends on what the what your post spike looks like. Okay. All right. So let's look at the next dilution. So a little bit more. See your nitrite. You're you're above. You're you're below your PQL. All right. So you could probably possibly do the other one because it's still a valuable. Even even though it was split, it's still yep. a valuable result. And those of you looking, so if you'll pay attention, let's let's back up one slide real quick. And so take a look at our scale on our y-axis. So this one's up to 3.44, and then we go forward again. And this one is now down to 0.687. So just so you can kind of keep an idea of the relative size of these peaks. We're, we're doing some serious solutions on this to try to resolve some of these issues that are coming out. Right. And and yes, definitely. So our nitrite, our, our so nitrate. So at this dilution, you it looks like uh, you know bromide and nitrate. See, you've, we've done. See now the nitrite, nitrate. Excuse me, is not on top of that peak over there on the, the fifteen yeah. watts. So see that right there tells you. See, it's still on top at that one. Yep. And now now it has separated. Now it's cleaned up. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Um, now I'll, you always have to remember you. Dilution is not always going to be the ultimate solution. No, because you then raise your reporting limits. Exactly, uh, you w raise them. There are, depending on your application, there are things out there. There are possible uh, digestions, cartridges, different things that you can use to help if you have samples like this at a constant time. Okay. And but 
for our needs right now, dilution is probably the best for us. That's, that's, that's always our initial start to see if we can make it work. Correct. Nice. Okay, let's keep going. Oh, maybe that was our final. Was, is this our post spike or? That okay. looks like that's a spike. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that so we're using this to make sure that we've got everything in the right places and correct and identified well. All right. So occasionally we get some non-target or ions as an interference. So um, again, this is just a very generic one, but um, that first peak we've seen that's that is something has plateaued out. We're going to pretend that's our normal seven wastewater anions, and that's most likely seawater and chloride has that would eaten, be chloride, the, yes. has eaten <laughs> your fluoride and your nitrate peaks, <laughs> or nitrite peaks, and, and yeah, that they're gone. That's that's pretty much it. And at that point, you, um, yeah, dilution and dilution is, dilution. is, is, is our friend here, <laughs> and, and hope that the rest of what we're looking for can be separated out. Well, uh, like your fluoride or your, ni or your nitrite. Uh-huh. If you were looking for those two, because it's so, you would have to dilute so much that you would probably just have to raise your reporting limit right. for nitrite, because you're not going to get any. And you honestly may end up just reporting a non-detect nitrite non at correct. 100x or something. Correct. Yeah. Those are tough. Um, I do know, so we, we talked a little bit before when we were prepping about um, some of the removal cartridges. Now, you mentioned that at a production lab, that's hard in your general anions. Correct. Yeah, we because we we are dealing with uh, short holes. Right, but uh, there are some cases where you actually do use the removal cartridges for a specific for a different run. We do use. Uh, I do one for for chlorate. For chlorate, okay. Uh, it's a silver, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Right. Okay. And that. And is, it removes the chlorides and the sulfates and stuff out so we can actually report per chlorate. Right, because per chlorates are really small concentrations. Uh, extremely, yeah, they're, you, they're uh, uh, PPB right. reporting limits. Okay, and so we've got to remove all that other stuff just so we can have a chance to even see. Yes, and, and it happens to be that a lot of that has a lot of conductivity in it. So we right. we use those on every sample as it is just instead of trying to run it and then having to go back and using it, we just run them on all of them. Okay, very nice. All right, let's go to our next one, soil samples. So soil samples are interesting. So <laughs> ions have to be in solution, otherwise they're not ions. Correct. Soils are solid, they're not in solution. <laughs> so gener generally speaking, what's, what's our procedure? Basically for you take a known amount uh -huh. of soil and you add a known amount of water. What's your general ratio? Uh, we use four grams to 40 mils. It's a 10x so solution 10 right more. off, right, okay. yep, right off the bat. And do soils present any other particular challenges? Obviously, they're going to definitely have more filtration issues. You really got to pay attention to your filters on those. Yes, uh, and you have to uh, make sure that the anions you're working for comes out in solution. Um, now we just do the seven, so we we shake it for an hour, yeah. and 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 pretty much everything goes into. Solution. Those are all very water soluble. In my previous job, we had sodium azide, which Ooh. had to actually be, we had to let it sit for 24 hours because it just did not go into solution. Still in water, just just a water soak. Yes, okay. but we had to do it for 24 hours, Make as sure opposed to yes, okay. depending on what it is you're looking for. So you have to know your product a little bit. All right. But uh, this we just do for an hour, and then we throw them on. And our biggest problem is fluoride doesn't come out well. <laughs> okay. And, and you brought some some uh, representative yeah. representative chromatograms of that. So let's look at some of those. So this Th is this one of your. This is a typical soil, one of our typical soil samples. Okay. And it, they usually don't have a lot in them because they're already done at a 10x. And fluoride's usually on the low side, right? But it usually has a little matrix issues. But okay. But when you go to spike it, because you do a matrix spike, you do it prior to right. Um, uh, soils that a lot of things that's in the soils and stuff like that likes to eat orthophos and bromide. So. Okay, so so this is our raw sample. So let's uh, click through to the next one, and this is a spike. That's a spike. And let's. I really, I, I guess I should have put these side by side so we could compare them. Let's <laughs> let's go back to the first one. So look here. So we've got three distinct peaks plus four fluoride. If we zoom in, we could see. But so four yeah. named peaks there. Four, four named fluoride, peaks. Fluoride, chloride, nitrate, and sulfate. Right. And then our spike. 
which is a known amount. And see that fluoride? It's only a 0. 0.1, and I can guarantee you that was supposed to, that was a 2.5 spike. <laughs> okay, so we essentially <laughs> lost all of our fluoride. And bacteria with bad teeth. Uh -huh. Maybe, I don't know. And orthophos, the same way. You don't even have a peak for orthophos. So the orthophos is also just gone. It's gone. <laughs> just, just gone. Something. And and I know that it's correct because we do have other anions in there that do. They all came out right. Correct. Yeah. Even even sulfate came out on the high side. So you've got some that are completely gone, and then you've got sulfate on the high side. Huh. Because that's a, that's a 10 spike. Okay. And yep. I think there was only five in there. Five. Well, there we are. So see, it was like 130 percent or something. Like Maybe, that. yeah. Who, who knows? Yeah. All, all sorts of interesting things. So yeah, so, so you so definitely you, have. They can present their own set of problems. Oh, definitely. That, that you have to be careful of. Really examine the spikes on those, so that. And and, and the thing is too is what I'm. Um, excuse me, but when you do a, a matrix spike, and when you're missing stuff, and you have to do dilutions. You have to dilute your spike also. Right. So you're not really seeing when you do the dilution, and the only way you can do that at that point is to do a post spike with a small amount, verify it, and then we let our clients know, hey, there's an interference. We verify it with a post spike. Right. That's the important thing to remember about matrix spikes is they don't fail your batch. They just you tell your client something's weird with this sample. Correct. And we don't know what it is, but there is a matrix problem. This is what we get. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on. So baseline interferences. Um, we talked about this a little bit about the beginning. I mentioned it. So there in that top graph, again, we see what commonly is called the water dip. Um, and that's where that, that is a, where your sample is being injected and you've got just water interfering with your eluent. Correct. And that's usually right around two, a little over two minutes. Right. Right before your first peak, usually. If you, if you right take your program fluoride. up, then you know, you're not getting anything before that first peak you're looking for. And so it shows up right before there. Mm -hmm. And then the suppressors usually will minimize those. That one is somewhat blown up. You can, or actually, that one's not blown up at all. There's no suppressor on that top one. Um, you can see it's up to 26, and then the bottom one, you can see that one, so this is from some specific instrument manufacturer, I don't remember who it is, their suppressor is the CRD, but um, you, that, on the bottom one, you can still see just the barest hint of that water dip um, right before peak number one, um, but with a suppressor, those do tend to fall out, um, and just the real, only thing you really have to be careful of is making sure that you are calibrating properly to take that into account. Right. Well, you know, ours, we have a suppressor and we still have the water dip. True. It depends on which column. And yeah, so everybody's, everybody's set up a little different, your yep. column, it, yeah, uh, whether you're running the continuous eluent generators right. or, you know, making your own daily or whatever. So yeah, so different things, you just have to be aware of it. Make sure Correct. that you, make sure that you take it into account with everything that you're doing. Carbonates, you can add a little bit of, uh, uh, Oh, you went to your samples and it will eliminate it also. Okay, there we go. So if you have a high carbonate peak, which in my on, on my column, carbonate would often, if it was really high, it would start to um, make the sulfate peak look strange and and kind of eat into that front end of it. Right. So that was something that we had to work, uh, work around. All right, I think we're getting close. Oh, so last topic, and this just is just a quick one here. Talk about it just briefly. A gradient. Um, a lot of people probably have a, a at least some kind of gradient just to start off your your uh, program. But generally speaking, what is a gradient in terms of IC? A, a gradient uh, is a mixer to where you can actually change your uh, eluent. Uh, Flow concentration. Concentration. Okay. Excuse me. And um, once you change, you can because you know certain things come off at a certain time, and then you can strengthen your eluent or weaken it to have something else come off at a quicker time or later. Push it back or, a little or bit. Push or push it back. Yeah. You know, just depending on depending on what your process is. Right. Uh. We did uh, perchlorate, which is normally uh, 
uh, this was a long time ago, we did perchlorate on a gradient method. Okay. But it, it took sodium hydroxide at the time, running it with all seven anions, it would come off 45 minutes. So what we were able to do is make it strength and have it come so off sooner. Push it faster. So we could get it faster and it would we could run all I mean well I think it still ended up being like forty five minutes with all seven anions. You right. can't do that if you don't have the gradient. Right. Yeah. I know um when my uh supervisor was training me on, on IC, um he I think I think he set me up uh with some of his leading questions <laughs> trying to trying to help me understand how this works because he said so you know we, he was explaining gradients to us and um you know saying so you know theoretically if we if we didn't even want to analyze sulfate on a particular sample we could just you know push it out you know and, and just kind of stop our run after nitrate and we're like oh yeah yeah that's a great idea save you know 10 minutes off a run or whatever and of course you know no you can't do that because it's still there it just hasn't registered yet. And Correct. so if you started your run next, you'd have this sulfate peak you showing up in, at the very beginning, killing fluoride in your next sample. Correct. So that, that's that's how gradients can kind of help us to push that tail well, end off. Well, flush your column, yes, it, it would help. It also helps flush. Right. Correct. And, and flush your column out. Okay, I think, yeah, so that's the last topic that we've got planned for our talk here. And so what we want to do is we've got the last 15 minutes or so that we'll open up to questions from you guys. So if you would, um, if you have questions, type them into the question box there in your interface. And we've got a couple coming up now. And so, all right, so let's start. No forcing through zero. Um, so at what, at what condition we force the calibration to zero? Okay, so do we force our calibration through zero? No. No. And that's that's a general EPA rule, right? Yes, it is. Yeah. So they don't they do not like uh, any calibrations forced through zero. You actually have to calculate as it as it has come out on your on your curve. And you and, have to and you have to run a linear curve, not a quadratic, too. Right. Yep. Also, all of our curves do have to be in a in a linear format, and um, make sure you know that y equals mx plus b kind of stuff. All right, cleaning up your system after running bad samples. What are what are some of your techniques for cleaning your system out? I um, depending on which uh, L you want you're using, right. you can use a little bit stronger up, and it works for me. And it's just a little trick I know. I I take and make about a ten times. Well, I have a stock uh, L you want stock L you want okay carb by carb, and then we use a smaller amount to put it to make the the eluent for our instrument. Okay, right, yeah. So it's a little bit stronger. It's about ten times stronger. And so you'll just run So that what through? I do is run two or three of those and I kind of stair step them add a little bit more with water. That way the first couple are at, you know, the ten X and right. the five. Stair step them and run four or five of those and then some three or four waters. So just and run them as an actual sample. As an actual sample, uh -huh. I run them through the system like that. Right. It kind of cleans it up a little bit. Okay. And then you start there. And, so, and that's, that's, that that's, flushes things off your column, cleans out your lines. Yep. And then you'll run your blanks again, and then you look at your blanks, and when you're still having problems, then you might have to. At that point, you might have to go through, and and start changing. Uh, maybe check your lines and stuff, because especially right before the column, right. stuff gets caught in there. Yeah, yeah, that, that shift from the guard to the analytical column or something yeah. along those lines, yeah. Um, so we actually didn't talk about guard columns at all. Um, guard columns, so they're basically, a guard column is just a smaller version of your analytical column that's used to do a little bit of pre-separation and absorb any shock from Correct. cations coming in or something that, that will really mess up your column. So that, that's what they're there for. Yeah. All right. Um, I had a bad experience of using the CRD from Dionics on a two millimeter column. Do we have any experience on this CRD? I do not. I do not I, either. I use yeah. four millimeter. Yeah, I, I don't CRS. have any. So I... I really don't have a lot of information on the yeah, two sorry, millimeter column. Uh, I don't know if that's Dennis or Denis, um, but yeah, sorry, we don't we don't have any experience on that one. Um, wish we could help you out on that. 
Um, isocratic gradient methods for routine anions. Oh, isocratic or gradient methods for routine anions. So mine, I, I know the one that I used was did have a gradient. It was, it, but it was just one shift. We had um, one um, level that we ran our eluent at for the first 10 or 15 minutes of our run, and then we cranked it up for the last five or seven minutes. Five, seven minutes to clean it out. That's usually, that's a typical. I do not. Okay. I, I don't use a gradient at all. We don't need to. Right. Um, uh, I usually run, you know, after the separation. We Every once in a while, I'll get a hit right. from, an, probably, it's usually probably oxalate or something. Okay. And But um, I don't typically use a gradient. Gotcha. And, and which column were you running again? I run the high, uh, the AS23, AS which is a which is a high. Um, yeah, okay. High capacity. High, high capacity. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right. Let's see. Uh, what happens in the suppressor, and is it replaced by age or symptoms? I think the suppressors have a lifespan programmed into them, right? The the instrument no maybe that was our eluent generator that had a lifespan. That one in. that one be programmed That's what in. It is, yeah. No, you uh, the suppressors are usually I've had them last for a year year and a half depending on how much use they get right. and and it is something that you just have to kind of know yes. how your instrument works. Right. Uh, you can get you will start so when it starts going bad you will see the extra spikes in your baseline. Right, Your you'll start starts seeing a away. lot of spikes, and so you'll know when it starts going bad. Yeah. So the suppressor is there to remove the electrical signal from your eluent. That's its purpose. There's, um, if you ever get curious, um, I did this one time when I had an old suppressor. I actually disassembled it. There's Everybody all, does. There's all Everybody sorts of does. fun stuff in there. Little cool little electrodes <laughs> and, and different plates and stuff that are working there. I, I, it, it's fun to look at, and I'm no electrical engineer, but I mean, I could at least theorize on how it's working, and, and it, yeah, right. they're, they're a lot of fun. So the next time you have to change a suppressor, if you haven't already, take it apart and, and look at what's in there, and you can kind of see. Um, unfortunately, I can't tell you to take a new one apart so you can compare a new one to an old one, yeah. um, but you can, you can see all the fun stuff inside. I want to go back to that. You typically use isocratic. No, we do not, because EPA... Want you to do linear and not isocratic. Uh, it, it, isn't isocratic just referring to no gradients? Oh, I'm sorry. I was thinking quadratic. Sorry, yeah, no problem. sorry, sorry. No sorry. Problem. Uh, concentration of eluents, if you're using a potassium hydroxide eluent for seven anion isocratic separation. Ooh, uh, that's. <laughs> so you're going to have to fine tune your instrument based on your setup. I, I know that much. It's, right, right, right. I'm sorry. What is your concentration of eluent if you use? That that would have to be probably your technical support from your instrument manufacturer. It depends on the column that. that you're, yeah, uh, it depends on the column, but you would be able to get that from your, whoever you buy your columns from. Yeah. They should have an app, an application for that. Right. And they should be able to tell you. I think uh, 50 millimolar is a usual one, but I'm I'm there, not yeah. quite sure. I can't remember because it's been a while since I've used uh, KOH for yeah. anion. So check check your column. Uh, there's probably your column came with a little bit of an insert that'll tell you what it was calibrated using. Either that or call or call oh. Dionics. They they'll give you an uh, an application for yeah. it. Yeah. They've probably done what you're trying to do, so they'll, they'll kind of know how to work with it. Correct. When do you know it's time to replace your CRD? Uh, when your chromatograms look bad? Yeah, you know. you, you'll see you'll see a lot of spikes. A lot of spikes in your baseline. Yeah. Is usual as as a usual one. Uh. So. Oh. Ten year warranty. Jack don't can, have to replace it. That I, is. That's we that's replaced nice, ours. <laughs> we replaced ours three times in two years. So it depends on. What you run. Yeah. Inverse peaks, the sign of suppressor age. Can be, yes. Uh, it's a, it's a, a, a bad suppressor can have all sorts of interesting effects on what your chromatogram looks like. The most usual one is noise in your baseline, but 
um, inverted peaks, you know, valleys instead can. If that's where you'll get the spikes, yeah, yeah. you'll see inverted or, yeah. All sorts of fun stuff happens with that. All right, we're about nine minutes to three, so we're closing in on the end of our time. Any any last questions from anybody? Um, all right, so barring a sudden influx, looks like we've got everybody taken care of. Once again, we appreciate everybody being here. Um, thanks for coming and talking with us, Mary. We appreciate it. This I, has been fun. I hope I can help. I hope yeah, a little. I, I don't this was, know. This was good. I, I enjoyed this. It, it was kind of, you know, a little fireside chat. Yeah, Everybody else yeah. got to listen in. Um, thank you all for being part of our third Thursday webinar series. Uh, we will have another one next month. The time or the dates may not be the third Thursday, um, depending on how we decide to work it out. Um, I'm on vacation that week. So we'll either have, maybe Becky will be a, a guest presenter, not a guest presenter, a stand-in presenter for me. Um, to, to take care of that, or we may shift it back a week uh, for when I get back. Although coming off vacation, I don't know how if I'll be any good to anybody for a while. So we'll we'll let you know. You will get the emails for next month um, and the topic and everything. And yeah, once again, we will um, post a recording of this on our website, and you can access that recording at any time. Uh, we don't send the slides out individually. Um, if any other questions pop up, send them to that same email uh, where you got your registration, or you can send them directly to me, David S at envexp.com, and we'll take care of you as best we can. Thanks again, and everybody have a great day. Bye.